Check this out news. We connect the streets. Either misconstrue, don't know, or don't realize that he's part of an algorithm. Uh, or at least I believe that based upon our just a short, short conversation. And, and Big U, I'd like, to, I'd like you to go ahead and tell us because I think there's a contrast. And, and I'd like to try to catch part of that and then be able to talk and delve into some things that I think Americans don't get and need to do something about. Well, um, exactly what are we referring to? I'm, I'm talking, uh, no, I'm going to keep it clean. I, I mean, like, for instance, there's a, there's a pathway. There, there's a point in time when you're either playing ball, playing things, playing the streets, and then all of a sudden somebody reaches out and pulls you a different direction. And, or, or, or it looks at choices that you find or found that were attractive that pulled you in a different direction. And at the end of the day, you find yourself going, going in a direction that you didn't ultimately really want to be in the end game. You enjoyed obviously some steps that you were in, but I, I think there are some, I, I think there are some things, some lessons learned that people can do some preemptive work that you will expose that uh, I don't think most folks realize. But see, I'm gonna tell you my personal belief, and and I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna tease it a little bit. There's a lot of people in this country of all shades that have made a choice at some point in time that took them down a pathway that was extremely beneficial, or it was not. No. And, and you told me something that I want folks to kind of understand and it tells us what we've got to do to help change that piece because there's both perspective and choice. So please, if you don't mind. No, I think what we were talking about is I was I was um I was elaborating on the fact that that um I really don't push the blame on other people's for the things that I went through. I take I tend to take responsibility for myself because I was at a point to watch it make better decisions, better choices. Instead of doing that, I made bad decisions, which led me to go down a road that led me to incarceration, led me to making uh, even worse decisions in my life, which made me actually an enemy to my people or deterrent to the success my people could have had. And I, and I was, I, I think this was what you talk referring to. I was elaborating even yesterday with some brothers, and I was explaining to them about policing. And what I feel about policing, I feel that we have the, the, the police department is a nesting ground for the Ku Klux Klan. But I don't think that we need to get rid of policing. I don't think that policing is 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 removing policing and the police force is the right way because I was talking to some brothers the other day and I was telling them, so what you gonna have? You gonna have the homies arresting the homies? You talking about community be policing? What we gonna have? Dudes pulling up on the street corner. Now he's a snitch, or he got to arrest his best friend. You always gonna need somebody who could be, uh, uh, who's not so close to the situation and can always their movement is with honor. Because even myself, I have limitations to the things that I would be able to do. Let's say they say, Big U, we gonna get you the police department. I couldn't take the police department. I couldn't do what police do. You know what I mean? In the community, police, you can't do what police do in the theory that people have in their mind. You need people who, who can be indifferent to the situation and who can come in and arrest people when we do crimes. And I'm talking about me, when we, me and whoever else. Um, I was talking to my home brother the day and I said, so what happens when you're not there your daughter gets into it with her boyfriend. He's gone crazy, flipped off on serum, ice, or methamphetamines, and you can't get there. Somebody has to come in and quell that situation. Sometimes it's gonna call, it's gonna require some kind of force. Our problem is we have the wrong people with the wrong mentality, and we need people. Who can understand and who can who can who can who can understand the sensitive needs of each situation and and address that situation for itself? 
Because now oftentimes we have a paramilitary mentality with our police forces. And so now everything with them is just attacked from the gate, pull the gun out. But I am definitely, definitely, I understand what they're saying about defunding the police department. I understand that. So I don't want to say I'm against defunding, but I want to say that I am a proponent of better education for police officer, higher education for somebody who's carrying a gun, you know what I mean? Emotional background checks, affiliation and um, um, gang affiliation, being often street gangs and these political organizations that people are a part of, the Ku Klux Klan and all that. I'm, I'm with that. But me and myself, I, I I feel like we have to take responsibility, which I do for myself. And I think that's what's, what was able to move me into a position of being somebody who's a tool for my people as opposed to somebody being uh, um, a negative force to my community. Now, now how were you when you first got into a set? Shoot, man, i um, be honest with you, I would think I would probably be born into it. I don't even know. I don't know. I think Crippen came in 69. I was born in 66. So as we moved from the east side of L.A. and we came to the west side, Crippen and gangbanging started growing. And my story goes with that. So as we got older, we started seeing we hearing Crippin. We hearing that dudes are getting their leather jackets, and you got to be a member of this. And so, there, at that time, there was still small organizations that was popping up, like uh, the Rolling Avenues. It was still kind of little community spots that was, was you know, maybe maybe um, Teen Post was gone. I think in my era, and so we we went to joining um, different small groups. I went, like I said, I went through the Boy Scout. I did that for a couple of years, and I think my mom, I did it. I'm not totally sure how long we did it. And as I got to about the sixth grade, and in the seventh grade for sure, we was all gang members. Everybody was a part of a gang. Member. So it was about seven. You're walking where I'm going to because what got you out of what got you out of scouts. What pulled, what what was the made for scouting unattractive? Because you you know it, it, some folks suggest that there were, one of one of the things was options being made available to the original members because whites weren't white. The, a lot of guys who were black were there weren't enough things like scouts. Everybody can't be a ball player because after a while you realize you just don't have it, and somebody's going to take that spot. And there's not enough of those kinds of things that keep you active and your mind's active? Well, I can tell you what got us out of it. I think it was the, the um, with me, it was the cost. With, with me, it was cost because my mother was, I was my mother's only son at the time. And then I had sisters. And my mother wanted to keep us active. So another reason why I was game banging hard because my mother couldn't afford sports. So I was either me cutting grass and get to go play. I wanted to play baseball, football. And the only thing that she really could afford was karate. And that was because my whole family did karate. So I'd been doing martial arts since I was seven, eight years old all the way through. And and so um, when it came to baseball, football, and all that stuff, we just couldn't afford it. I don't have like the, the – uh, the you know the, the the whatever story, but ours was financing. My mother was by herself, and um, my stepfather went to prison early. I really didn't really get to meet my father until I was what coming out of juvenile hall. I got out of juvenile hall. I got arrested for some crimes, and he came and got me. I got kicked out of state of California. I got kicked out of California, and I went to go live with him. And it was our first time really meeting. And so, and like me and a lot of other brothers, it just wasn't nothing there. Like even today, I deal with young black men who come to my store on Christian on Slauson about, I would say about 10, 11, 12, and they don't have nowhere to sleep. You know what I mean? And that's what led us to game. That's what really got, I'm going to say that's what led me to doing crime. Because I can remember when, when I couldn't go to my mother's house 
or I could go to one of my auntie's houses, we would be out just walking the street, 11, 12, trying to get a dollar. So now we're breaking into stuff, and we're trying to find somewhere to sleep, and we got to sneak in one of the homies house when his parents go to sleep, or one maybe an auntie house, we sneak in the window, and everybody crowding there. We got to be up and gone before they get up. And that led us to that led us to, to actually commit crimes. And I see that happening right now today in our neighborhood. And I see these youngsters. And I got a store. I can't leave them in the store all night. You know what I mean? And I'm telling them, man, if y'all steal something, I'm not letting y'all come back. You know what I mean? And so I'm buying hotel room. This is happening today, right today. Like the last four nights, I'm getting hotel rooms, cheap hotel rooms, and then I got to manage that situation because we got young black boys, and then they telling me, well, we had to rob somebody to get something to eat because we couldn't find you, and you didn't answer the phone. You know what I mean? So if I take off if I take off a date, like right now, I got a couple of them calling me right now as we are on this thing right now. You know what I mean? And they join a gang. Because they go to certain parts, and the only way you can hang at the park is if you become affiliated. Because the dudes in the parks ain't letting you hang unless you join. You come from the hood. Part of the team. See, this yeah. is, this, 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 you, you're, see the, the, the path where you're saying, because see, I got this. My, my aunt let me stay in Scouts and because we couldn't afford it. But I was doing the same. I was getting grass in Plymouth, South Carolina to go ahead and be able to do some of those kinds of things. And 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 I and I didn't know I was a I was really a pretty good athlete until later, but the reality is is that somebody it was a whole bunch of folks around me, and that's why today I actually work with multiple folks that's helping them one stay active, and then more importantly try to prepare them for what's next. You know, I, I, uh, there's a because as an adult we got a responsibility to look at them for what's coming up, what's going to be out in the future, you know, and, and, right. you know, a lot of, a, a lot of them look for what kind of jobs going to be out there for me. We, we know that the world is going to be tech savvy in the future, but more important than just being tech savvy, it's a way to think. It's a way to think because it, you, it, when you're young, everything is right in your face. If it is money, it's food, Maslow's theory of needs, if you will. I gotta survive, and then I want. And you gotta do those things, and you and you hit the nail on the head. So these guys looking at survival, and oh, by the way, if they see somebody with the big rims, the nice car, and they got money in their pocket, that's attractive. So if somebody doesn't step in, give them a view, a vision of something deeper, and then at the same right. time, stay with them and stay with them. You know, I was I was I was jinking on O'Shea and. And, uh, uh, and and Mike earlier because they don't make us, I'm an alpha man. And one of the things I'll tell them, we got a responsibility to stay in contact. We've got a responsibility to stay in contact with young men. And by the way, be able to deal with them with some of the tough situations that you're doing. Because, and then show them a few, show them a vision. In some cases, reach back and share with them not all of our bad stuff because you know, then they'll think it's okay and they'll believe they can survive that because we know we're one algorithm away, most of us, from having done something bad. There's a uh, there's a four-star general named, a white guy, named uh, General Wallace. He got arrested at 16 and for shoplifting. He was on the one side, but he survived that thing and, and he shares that because a lot of people were thinking, hey, look, He's a bad kid. This is a bad kid. He expresses that to tell folks that when everybody that did something bad ain't bad. They do it for various and different reasons. And see, one of the things that I push for is trying to catch folks like you because, see, you got natural leadership. Some of us get trained to be leaders. You're natural leader. And if we can catch some of these natural leaders that folks don't know exist or believe they're bad, catch them early, give them some kind of a different foundation. See, I, I, that's my part of what I believe about, about America is that one, we got more talent. We got more talent that's, you know, I use the, I use the word U3D. You've heard me say this before. Underserved, undervalued, underrepresented, and disenfranchised. Because if, mm -hmm. they don't, if they don't believe that about this country, 
they will seek its destruction because they don't care. You know, that's why folks start defund the police. And, say, and by the way, I disagree with that, but I agree with you. We've got to get better. In the United States Army Special Forces, the selection process for that kind of a mission puts a lot of weight on psychology testing. People that one, when they get in a situation, they don't go to themselves. They, right. they don't go to that, that evil part of us that says, take him out. Um, I'm mad, so he needs to feel my he needs to feel my anger. That's what I think George Floyd was, was experiencing. I don't I don't know the detail, don't know the relationship, but that was a, that was a situation where the person in charge got caught up in Iraq. And, and if I may say this, in Iraq, there was a situation, a scenario where one of my guys was killed, gangland style, shot right in the neck. I'm coming in, I'm walking up, I'm holding his hand, I'm watching him go cold. I'm watching his teammates and they're up on their feet because they want to go get some. Anybody, somebody, and they want to get some. And I'm sitting there trying to find all the leadership and find something to bring them back to center because I feel that anger too. But I found I found a, 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 a woman, an all black, she's on her knees and she's praying for my soldier. See, I got to let them know that that's, that's not everybody. That's not everybody. And so we got to find center because, and oh, by the way, we got to go get that guy because he represents something else. But we got to be the same way. We've got to say everybody that don't share your skin tone is unlike that. Folks who who look at, I'm going to keep pointing the wrong direction. Folks who look at that thing, they don't realize that's a whole bunch. That, that red stripe stands for blood. And the first guy to die for it was a guy of our school, was a guy that looked like us. The first guy. Right. And then I got a whole bunch of family members that I put that over top of. So I don't walk away from it because it's, it's the vision, it's the dream. We got to keep telling that story to our folks and make sure they understand that scenario, the things you're in, aren't necessarily everybody, everything, and everywhere. We've got to be bigger than that. Leaders like you, leaders like O'Shea and Mike, they've got to step up and help us. And we've got to try to bring our folks back to center so they understand that, one, you got a place. we got to use those tools to get us to go forward. Hey, I wanted to just interject. I'm sorry, Big U. I'm sorry, brother. I wanted to just um, make sure I, I let everybody know that just joining us that the theme of this is Two Worlds United. And obviously, man, to hear uh, two individuals such as yourself having a conversation about what leadership is and what it means in this in this current time, I wanted to um, I wanted to throw this question out there to both of you and just get your thoughts. I mean, I know you got that jersey behind you, uh, Big U, and just see what you thought about Drew Brees and his thoughts. Um, you know what I'm saying? Just with this whole anthem thing and, and what's going on. And then, of course, you too, General Bray. Just getting your thoughts on all of that uh, in this current climate. Well, my thought is it was calculated. I, I don't accept this apology because I I, I I know Drew Brees is an intelligent, white, privileged athlete who has been um um who, who has been in a situation to where he's more intelligent and more knowledgeable than he, than he claimed to be. I believe that, not believe, I can see that Drew Brees was making a speech. There wasn't just a question asked to Drew Brees, and he went on a 15-minute a, a dissertation on kneeling and disrespecting the flag. That was calculated. You know what I mean? There was a calculated question, and then there was a calculated answer. And then I think it was a, I think it was a, uh, um, it was a, a, a ploy by the, by who called it left or right, whatever they want to be called, to sway the narrative again. You know what I mean? It wasn't like if you come and ask me a question, like you just asked me about Drew Brees. He was prepared for that. Drew Brees been around too many African American men. Drew Brees knows the climate of the NFL. He knows the pay difference. He has competed against black quarterbacks. He has had black quarterbacks who's been under him. He has had he's seen people compete physically in different positions throughout his competition. 
He knows the NFL. And he knows just like Paulie Kaepernick. Nearly had nothing to do whatsoever with disrespecting the flag. We all know that. You can get away with that before the coronavirus with people like they say they didn't have time. Well, people got time. And everybody is going back and looking and saying he was never saying he disrespected the flag. He was actually kneeling. And there was a white military officer who told him to kneel. So all of this information is at Drew Brees' feet. He, tend, he decided to kick it. When he woke up the next morning, he found out that this issue was a lot bigger. And him and the NFL and Donald Trump and the rest of them weren't going to be able to just keep this under the table. No, nah, man, I mean, I can apologize for doing wrong to my people because I'm fighting every day to do right. And my wrong wasn't last week. My wrong wasn't this. Drew Brees is almost 40, if not 40 already. Come on, brother. <laughs> Come on, brother. <laughs> I got you. You ain't having it, uh, General Bray. What do you want to say on that? I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna roll back. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to do something that that, that I always do. I, 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 first of all, I try to get inside the shoes of the other guy. I, I, I think Drew Brees has a Purdue graduate. I agree with you. He's a smart guy. I don't think he can. I don't believe as much as he's been around the 75 percent of the black NFL. He still fully embraces or understands white privilege. He doesn't understand the frustration. See, I, I, I my, my dad served in World War II. Uh, my stepdad served him multiple times. Uh, and and I and and I'm I'm old enough to remember when we as a people were really proud we could be in uniform and how we fought to be warriors. We fought to be warriors because we couldn't for a long time. So so my 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 view and vision was framed and shaped by folks who really were busting their butt to 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 to, to be part of the idea. And, and and again, I recognize that we aren't there yet, but that dream that was crafted in 1770, we were fighting for that. So when Drew Brees is talking, I, I think he doesn't understand the frustration that many African Americans, especially those born uh, after the 1970s, understand because you see, I wasn't born black and proud. Okay, I wasn't born black and proud. I was born black. I was born proud because my mom, my mom did that. My my mom worked hard to make sure that one, I was a proud person and made me compete. My dad didn't think that way. You know, rest in peace. He didn't think the same way. So. When I grew up, I was fighting. To I was fighting to and competing. I didn't think I had some of those roles. So some of the folks that we're talking about, you got to understand that there is that part of of who we are. And so, guys like Drew, Drew Brees, he's he's hearing the frustration in the locker room because I know that he hears, but he can't he can't get it. He can't get it because he sometimes thinks when he gets in that huddle on the field that all of his teammates have the same experience of football, the same experience of getting up at five in the morning and compete, and he hears it. And so he thinks he's got it, but he doesn't. And so then he separates, and of course, he probably has political associations. I do not know. And so I'm not going to I'm not gonna lie to that because I don't know. I do know that our president, our current president, doesn't really get it. He doesn't respect the Constitution, and many of my fellow uh, generals feel the same way. He does understand that that flag stands for the ability for people to peacefully protest. You know, to peacefully protest. That's what they have the right to do. That's what Kaepernick did. Now, in all fairness, remember, Kaepernick didn't kneel first, but he found a friend that explained to him, if you don't, if you just kind of sit down, it feels disrespectful. So his friend told him kneel, because that is respectful, because that pays homage to those folks who died for it. And so he moved forward in that direction to show that one, it's not about those who fought and died for it. 
It's about the condition that we experience in America. Okay, now, so so listening to Drew, listening to the excerpts, because I haven't listened to the whole thing in Drew B's 15 minute dissertation, and I agree with yeah. you. You remember, he, he, is, he is in fact smart. So he would, yeah. so it, it will have been prepared. His agent will have told him, probably given him some things, some thoughts to try to clean up what has happened. But but again, so, so as a Christian, that, that part plays into it too. We're, I'm, I'm programmed and designed to say, okay, I'm going to give you a chance because it's not what he said then, it's what he's going to do next. That's what matters. What are you going to do? See, I, I kind of like, I kind of like words, words, okay. And I'm going to take you at them for a while. But I want to see your actions because the actions define you. Your actions define you. And so, because you can't do but so many. And I'm not talking about one. I'm not talking about two. I'm talking about actually defining who you are my character. So I'm putting that, I'm, I'm putting the, 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 the final answer to, to his thing in, in, in that perspective because I do believe I do believe that it was it was calculated and we'll see how it goes from here because there's an NFL players association that he's got to talk to and they're going to put together a pattern of what their response is going to be collectively and then because they've got to design an answer but a, but a person that kneels I mean I'm a soldier I'm a, I'm a former airborne ranger and I'm also the I'm also the descendant of a bunch of folks who bled and and those that blood and, that, and those stripes that's mine too. So that, that's mine too. And then, by the way, it's yours. It's it's Michael Jordan's dad. It's an awful lot of us that began with Christmas Addict taking that first bullet for the design of this thing. And that's why I think a little differently. But at the same time, I fight for a person's right for freedom of expression. I wanted to ask you all both as well. Obviously, George Floyd has been um, hashtagged and it's, it's global at this point. And it's, it's really sparked something that I don't think anybody could have ever imagined. What are your, what were your, your thoughts when you initially saw that video, um, Big U, um, and, and, and just what's happened in the aftermath of it uh, with the whole world? I mean, the protests in New Zealand, protesting in Paris and London, all through Europe and Asia, uh, without any regard at this point, even for the coronavirus, the COVID-19. And I say that, you know, with the utmost respect for individuals really on both sides, really having to lay it on the line. Obviously, you have a lot of armed forces. What were your thoughts for you when you initially saw that video coming out of Minneapolis? You know, uh, uh, when I first seen it, I, I'm three hours behind the rest of the world in California. So what happens is because I post a lot of stuff, and uh, informing the community. I use my platform to inform a lot of people. And me and Sean King are real tight. I, I had to, I think maybe four or five people who had sent the video to me. And I looked at it, but I didn't look at it fully because I thought it was something that was old. Because I was thinking, I had seen this already before. Right? And because I have seen so many black men die, it took me back to the Rodney King. And I didn't post it because now what I do with a lot of stuff I get, I try to fact check it before I put it up on my page. So I never got around to fact checking, fact checking it, fact checking it, but I got a text message from Sean King to look at it. And then I went back and looked at it. And I was like, I watched it fully through and I was like saying to myself, damn. I can remember how many times I was in that position. I can remember how many times I was in that position in the county jail, on the streets, dealing with cops who had the power to do what they wanted to do until I got old enough to say, you can't do me like that no more. I'm going all out. But my feelings when I first seen it was I've been in that position, exact position before. When police hold one leg down and they and, and you and, and you cuffed up and you got another police on top of your neck spitting on you, talking to you, telling you what's gonna happen. I was in that position in 1991. 
three months after me, a couple of days after that, I was in I was in the hole in the county jail. They said some police had got stabbed. You know what I mean? So I was my first time going per per. It was my first time really learning the law. I was twenty I was twenty two years old, and they accused a couple of us for stabbing some sheriffs, but I didn't have nothing to do with it. But you ain't gonna do me like that no more. So in my mind, I was thinking, this is crazy. So the, what I visualized and seeing it, I think what hurt the world more was everybody verbalizing you're killing him and him asking for life. Because absence, the, the crowd being there and them describing he's losing his breath and people trying to get involved and, and the officers look in return like I'm gonna show you is what's really galvanizing the people more. Because another another kid just get got gunned down in California the same way. The other brother that got choked out in New York. But it wasn't that crowd there trying to film. You got a white lawyer, you got a white lady who's either I think she was saying she was a lawyer or she was a, no, she was saying she was she was a, a medic or something, and she's saying. You see, identified herself. You got brothers identifying herself. They trying to get there, so the public is involved, trying to say this man. There was no public involved in Rodney King. There was no public involved with, uh, with Castile. There was, you know what I mean. So when I felt, man, I felt pain. And what's going on now? I don't want to never justify somebody looting and tearing up somebody else's stuff, but. Until a person is 100% fed up with something, change will never come. Change will never come. You can be 75% fed up. You can be 90% fed up. You can be 95% fed up. Change not going to come until people are 100% fed up and they move. And then they have to continue to move. Uh, General Bray. Yeah. I'm going to tell you, there's two reasons why this is very different. If you ask the question of a crowd, say, ask them how many people have ever watched somebody die. The world got a chance to watch somebody die. You, I mean, you saw him pleading for life. You saw him die. My first thought, I'm like you, you. I uh, big you, so in case there's a little you out there somewhere, there's a there's a uh, there's this moment when you know there's so much stuff that comes across the internet and you see it. And when I looked at, it, I said the person said to me, I said, "Can you validate? Can you validate?" And and they made it close hand and they said, "Just send." Then I flipped over to look at to see it. It was also now being shot on the on the internet on major channels. And so I'm looking at it and I'm sitting there saying, "This is different. This is very different for a lot of reasons." Because one, people, many people who've never seen somebody die, you see them die. The second point was, if you watch the officer, his knee is in his neck, and everybody knows. You know, you're a martial artist. You know, I cut this off within 30 seconds. You are going to black out. Exactly. 30 seconds is all you need. Once I get there, you, that's, and so that's why the tap out, that's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. In fact, we train to fight like that so that people start black. So when you when the world starts going black, you do this. You start, because you know what's coming next. You're going out. Exactly. And if you go too long, you're going to die. We know that. This man started foaming. And we started foaming, that's the, body, that's the body asking for help. But what did, yes, you sir. Never, yes, sir. what did you never see? This officer never even he looked never down, he never, he never looked down at the man. Yeah, he's, he still, him in he's foaming, he's begging for life, and then it goes quiet. He doesn't move, the body has gone limp already. It was apathy. That is something that while indifference is what Big U talked about, we got to be indifferent. A policeman has to be indifferent, or at least for the parents, of, but he never has to be apathetic. He didn't even care. He, no. he really did. 
He did he leverage himself on him. He didn't right? care in the show. So that was significant. And the world saw that. Now that's this is what this is where I say that I bring a different, another perspective. See, the world still sees the United States as the shining city on the hill. They still see us as the example of what's different. See, American slavery is unique. You said in the paper I sent to you, American slavery is unique because it's the first time slavery was defined and used by color. I say world, that the U.S. slavery, but it was made popular with the United States but because tribes were before that and tribes kept different, different things. But it changed. And the world saw us because we're the first place. We stopped Christ, We stopped the Christian wars. And so people found us as a place to come to survive, to be literally the all you can be, to be the best you can be. They still see us like that. And they see us because we have, you know, some folks talk about other countries that, that oh, by the way, I feel better about a black, being a black man. That's because you, you're one of the few. Like you're in Saskatchewan. You are not a threat to anything over there by your existence. You were all they saw, and you were you were that you were that animal in the first time when the bear sees a human being, he ain't scared. He don't care. But all of a sudden, when they start seeing threat, that's different. The world is like that. The world sees us as the shining city on the hill. And when they saw us, they saw our examples of leadership being different to a human being's life. It made them feel so type of way. And by the way, the world's browning scene. We're no longer defined. People try to compare 1954 to today and the boycotts of 54. In the boycotts of 54, if there was a black and white household, they were illegal. So all these families that are intermixed now, their, their world has been impacted. So, so, so uh, Okay, excuse me. So their world's impacted. So now it matters. It matters to more than just that black or white person that you can see readily identifiable. The one drop rule is still in effect. The difference is they don't realize the one drop is in most people. And so yeah. now everybody is being threatened. And so that's what changed and made it very different. Now the challenge is leaders got to step in because see, everybody that's with us ain't like us, ain't for us. There are groups out there right now who are infiltrating these legitimately frustrated organizations. And that, because that's what you're seeing. They're frustrated. They're, they're that, in that room when you get there and you punch the wall. That's, but that's you know real. what? I, I, you know See, what, Jim, let me say. Right, go ahead. Let me, let me say something to that. And I, I, was, I, I was in a discussion with uh, a couple of prominent people and they was talking about the infiltrators and all this. And I said, well, you know what? That's what you asked for. If you stop people from killing innocent people, you don't never get that. That's right. So you can't you can't cry about what you did if you're not doing something to, to prevent it. If you consistently you have look, there's no way in the world we cannot we can mill over addressing uh, racism in America nope. because we talk about the rise of the flag, but we don't talk about the fact that the flag had a 400 year head start off the off the bodies of, of, of slaves. You know what I mean? A 400 year head start. The little sister was talking about monopoly on on, on, um, on the Instagram, on, on social media a couple of days about how everybody was playing monopoly but us. I don't even need to be in the way. I'm gonna. I wasn't gonna go into detail, Big U, but I gotta do this for you because this way you could it, it'll kind of make some sense to you know. I mean to 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 everybody because see, I, I I briefly said that what we had a unique version of slavery. Remember, people have seen the the, the fictitious letter of George Lynch but, the, Lynch, but the reality of what took place on it. For instance, here's what happened, and this is the economic part of it. Because people called slaves property, because and there was and there was two different versions. There there were for a while there was a tent, there was a tent to it, but in sixteen in sixteen nineteen, we started finding out that we basically found that Sub-Saharan Africa gave us Sub-Saharan Africa gave us a plantation for slaves, because the tribal factors were fighting each other, and they would and they and they would capture each other and give some away and they say, oh wow, this is. 
This is a way to keep me from losing my slave in, in the population. And so people who were free blacks around the world, especially in the Western world, had to start carrying papers to prove that they weren't slaves. Because if they were dark skinned, you could be a slave. Now, to make it even more valid, and this is where we're getting to, to make it valid, to make it work, I've also got to demonize that person of dark skin. More important than demonize him, I got to, I got to put a psychology in him that he is inferior. And in this country, with the exception of the few pages of the Declaration in the preamble of Declaration of Independence, see, that was kind of the loophole they screwed up because it was written, it says all men are created equal. And so even though they had done all the rules, make it so you're three-fifths of a human being, even you had and even though you had started trying to keep a, a, a slave from reading and writing and understanding. You under, they underestimated the fact and the intelligence of the people that they had enslaved, but they were still doing rules. And see, this is the part that some people still don't get. Even though the 13th Amendment freed slaves, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment start to try to start to try to do that work. But guess what? 1965, we're still trying to get those kinds of rules in place, and we've done all those things up to that point. To, de to demonize, make him less than a human. And oh, by the way, this is where privilege comes in. They've also been telling, enforcing, telling other folks that you're superior. And so that chasm, that gap is what was really driving an awful lot of those things. And that, and that's what that frustrates women. Even the laws, we are still ratifying what was written in 1866 1965 into the 2000s to look, make look you're you gonna go let me, let me address i want to address some things i got to say oh. I, I gotta go all the way back to what you first said because see it's always a misnomer when people start to try to quote and put black people at the feet of white people doing slavery if we gonna go we gonna go back to that the mentality of when when there of course there were people who were at war with each other who who sold their enemies into slavery but not knowing what this slavery was because like you said earlier nowhere in the world has anybody ever been through what we went through in this country which is called chattel slavery yes okay so what we went through in this country is unlike anything else in the world which were created by the persians okay persians christian jews or whatever have you which created what we went through here chattel slavery Never in the world has this ever been seen. So this is what the world sees different than what we see. So when there was so-called slavery in Africa, it wasn't you lose your name, your right to breathe, your right to eat and sleep, you couldn't get married. You had to pay homage to a village for taking a life or hurting somebody or stealing something. So there was a debt you had to pay for a certain amount of years. What we went through here in this country cannot be milled over by nobody because it's never happened until it happened in this country under that flag, never. We created piracy. The word pirate comes from this nation trying to continue to do slavery. These people have 400 years of free education while we was in the, while we was in the born yard working. They were able to send their kids off to travel the world and become Donald Trump's. Milk and Martin and all the rest of these people. While ours couldn't do nothing but work in the fields. So when it came time for my uncles to go join the army and all that out of Southern Mississippi, Columbus, Mississippi. My grandfather was like, hell no, you ain't going to fight for them. So we was on two different spectrums. My mother was like, you ain't never going to no army. So yours family did. Now me, I have never stood up for the flag prior to this because <laughs> after, I was a, after I was a felon, I felt the flag wasn't for me anyway because I don't enjoy the rights. This so-called who have 
who have got feelings. I don't enjoy those rights. So even before Carly Kaepernick and all this other stuff, I didn't stand for the flag. But mine was a conscious decision in my own protest because I'm a felon. Secondly, it has never meant that to us because we have never been inclusive in it. And that's because everything in this country has been white. As a young black boy, you start to understand and growing up, we understand Superman is white. The police is white. The teachers is white. All the people on TV is white. Bro Derek is white. Everybody is white. Jesus is white. So if I'm a black kid growing up in this country and all the power is white, I only got one way to go to join their army and to fight for their flag. I don't have no way I can make it in this country. Because the white man is going to see me and pull up on me. If I'm not an athlete, I don't get no other way. I'm not saying me. I'm telling you from my comment. When I'm, 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 look, I'm, I'm feeling, I'm listening. Because First of all, I, I got that. I, I want to make sure two things are clear for you, first of all. The first thing mm -hmm. is, is that internal, African internal slavery, wholly different. When I talked about the plantation piece, that was really and truly, that was, that was the European view that basically saw a chance to leverage something that they had. And by the way, the, the, the kings of Africa and the warlords of Africa, when they gave away those uh, the war booty, they had no idea what they were giving them into. But, but they gave exactly. away that guy. So I'm, I'm with that, so stay, so stay with me now. But once they got on there and they, and they left, they became the economic chief engine that, that was able to be used to do all the things as America. So I, you, you're right on there. But, but, but wait, let me, let, me, you just, let, let me say, let me add this. What people right. tend to forget, prior to them going and dealing with one and two nations, over 500, over, over, over a couple of hundred million, we're talking about over a couple of hundred million, white people tend to want to go and say, one city or one group of people may have did deals with them. But prior to that, Let's go back to what the Persians was doing and what the Jews was doing. What they were doing, kidnapping Africans well before they started kidnapping Africans and bringing them to the Americas. Yeah. So we're talking about a practice that proceeds that proceeds America. There, there, and in the yeah. chattel there, there, slavery. There, there were two things going on. First of all, when, it, when they found that there was the opportunity and it's important, the opportunity to go ahead and get folks, kidnap them, take them out and move them, that, that just added to, that was just additive. And we were able to bring them out of those countries and make that and make that come to pass. So that's, that's what I'm getting at because that's what makes American slavery so different. So understand that. I even feel your frustration because that's what, this is important because that's the frustration that most folks can't get because just like you're talking about your grandparents and those folks who, who uh, were expressing their resistance, because that was also King's position. Because it, it, now we, but we got that in the late '60s. Because literally up until that time, guess what? It, we when we went to war, we went to war up until that time. They didn't believe we could fight. They didn't think we would fight, even though it is. But stand by, even though in the, in the Revolutionary War, many of us were actually given positions in the military in lieu of our master going to going to war. And there were some rules associated with the rules. The rules said if you fought for your master, you were freeman. But the reality is while you were free, your family wasn't. So I I fully understand all of the history that goes behind it and all the frustration that goes behind it. But see the loophole in the Constitution, the one that maybe Sally Hemond probably influenced through Thomas Jefferson when he wrote All Men Are Created Equal, because it's the preamble to the Constitution, it left that loophole. And believe it or not, a lot of these soldiers specifically were fighting for our complete inclusion. They were fighting for that complete inclusion. Some were fighting for different reasons, but that's why it's different. And by the way, the, the, what you're saying and what you feel and the guys who don't kneel who kneel and, and but they're still in the country they're still living here because then that's what this place was founded on that idea so 
So we fully accept that because we also know that, believe it or not, every person that's not black that's here in this country doesn't necessarily embrace the ideas behind it. But that's okay. There's, there the leadership of this country has to embrace it. And all those soldiers that raise their right hands, all those soldiers, sailors, admiral, marines that raise their right hands, they're still fighting for the idea. They're still fighting for that idea. And, and guys like me, still an idealist and will always be an idealist. Now, I want to just interject real quick, Jim Bray, and say um, I know you fought for uh, the inclusiveness of uh, Muslim Americans, and I know Big U, you studied um, and actually probably dealt with perhaps um, some persecution because of your relationship with Minister Farrakhan. And I wanted to kind of get a perspective because I feel like you know, you both have a, a, a significant level of consciousness and it's about, like I said, this is all about two worlds coming together um, uh, in terms of just what Texas out is all about. And I wanted you guys to kind of expand, if you don't mind, on just that whole thought process because we've seen that be a major divider, especially in America, especially recently. Uh, it was brought up during Obama's uh, tenure when, you know, it was questioned whether he was Muslim American and as if being Muslim, you couldn't be, even if that was the case, that he couldn't be the leader of the United States. And I also wanted you to kind of expand maybe on the thought process of Obama being biracial and how that might have been beneficial for him as president um, in you know America during the time in, in terms of kind of bringing the country together. I don't know if either one of you wanna you know, kind of start on that. Again, I'm gonna let oh, him go first because I'm, I'm not a man of the time. I, I, I call, exactly. I, I call. I'm, I, not I don't, I don't I'm not a man of Obama. Okay. Yeah. All right. I want to hear that thought, though. Um, you, because I know you were in Chicago as well. But General Bray, what are your thoughts on it? First of all, there's two things that I said earlier. People forget that the uh, the, the the founders of this country they really remember many of them were Christians who were fighting against each other, and, and so every now and then I hear these I hear evangelicals talking about. This is a Christian country. It, while it was different religions that of, under the Christian faith that were principled, but there were actually uh, all faiths represented. Allegedly, there was at least one Muslim that was a that was uh, part of the founding group, if you will. But uh, so, so, so I, I will go in for a second. First of all, the, the the faith. That's why the life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are the three liberties that we that we fight for. Part of that's your spiritual definition. That's a personal piece. That's a personal piece. And so, in fact, the Jewish congregation out of Rhode Island wrote to, uh, because you know, Massachusetts was very hard uh, Anglican Christian. And so they even had on their books into the early 1980s, their authority to kill somebody from Rhode Island. It was an antiquated, but it was on the book because they were, they were radicals. Because that's some of those rules existed, but the congregation, the Jewish congregation, wrote to Washington and said, "Do we have the right to practice our faith in this country?" And the answer came back in a, in a resounding yes. One of the first parts of the United States military was the was the authority for people to practice their faith. My dog tags has my faith on it. Mine. Everybody else gets to do the same thing, because. And that's why it's really important that every time somebody starts to try to put faith into law, you can't legislate that kind of a freedom. You got to operate the space for people to go and practice their faith as long as their faith, their action, their practices do not infringe on someone else. So, so that's pretty important. That's one of the that's one of the big things that again you fight for. You talk about the uh, freedom of expression. That's a huge one because the expression, your spiritual piece is, is a big deal. President Obama, President Obama represented, you know, the, the, the browning of America. If you notice, there are folks who, when they really love him and they happen to be Caucasian, then he's half, he's, he's half white. When others see him because of his tint to his skin, he's, he's black. Uh, president Obama, was a president. He's a president of two of two parents of two parents that were 
looking like the rest of the world. They met each other, fell in love, made a child. And so while I was proud to see him uh, take that seat, and I went to both inaugurations, because that to me was an expression of the majority of the people in this country and their willingness to accept somebody who wasn't necessarily like them. President Obama tried to be a president, and he tried to tell that to people routinely. In some cases, they were, he was told that they, people attacked him because that he wasn't black enough. But his agenda was his agenda was to try to be. That's why he. That's why he didn't try to be as controversial. That's why you don't have all the dirt on him, because in some cases there are some things that I disagree with him about. But guess what? He tried to be. He tried to be president for all people, and in some cases you're never going to. You know, Big U knows as a leader, you're never going to please all the folks that work work for you. But your goal is to try to move the organization in a place in a way that is best for all. Sometimes they like it, sometimes they won't. His biggest success story is this. He did eight years. He walked away from there without the scandals and the expectations that people want. People tried to get him to be upset, to act upset. Then they got pissed because he was too cool, because he didn't flex. He was just a president that happens to be of color. Mentally capable, physically capable, and stepped up. That's my thoughts. Big you now before you respond, it's important I wanted to add this because I'm I'm very interested to hear your perspective as well on Obama. But do you think um I, I've heard a lot of questions of blackness and questioning what it means to be black in America? And I think General Bray, you kind of you brought that up a bit. Uh, I saw some of the traditional civil rights leaders that we had here uh, questioning Obama. And I was somewhat disappointed in how that went down publicly because I felt like um, from a chinks in the armor standpoint, now I do recognize, you know, for me, Big U, my family is from West Africa. You know what I'm saying? So I'm first generation here. So that's why even when I would look at Nipsey, I was really impressed at how, one, you all embraced him and also the way he responded. But I know when you come from another country, you have to be diplomatic, you know what I'm saying, in order to even navigate those type of waters. But what are your thoughts on Obama um, and him as president, as well as, you know, just uh, the fact that he was obviously biracial and maybe what impact that had uh, on on his tenure in office and whatnot? I don't think I have uh, concentrated on him being biracial or none of that. I, that right there to me has never been a factor. Um, but I, I always, you know, I mean, you know how you feel like uh, somebody could have did more. Um, you know, somebody could have did more, but you, you know, you feel like when when he was elected, we all felt like we had one of ours in. And what what the brother just said, what the general just said is, he wasn't one of ours. He was just a great president for the United States of America. So understanding from my point of view now as somebody my age and the general and yourself, we understand the presidents really deal with foreign policies and, and, and from the federal government. And that what we as a people, if you want to see change, you need to deal with small government. So and, and, and I'm at the point in my life where I understand that. So it's not that I expect expected a lot out of Obama, but you more than I expect out of the the people I see, the city council, the mayor, the governor, governor of California, these these great states. I understand that, and so when I see on hindsight what what Trump is doing, Trump is changing the pentium. Trump is like we gonna do it this way, and I don't care what nobody say. I'm the president. You know what I mean? I would have expected that attitude out of Obama, but I also, as a man, got to understand that Obama couldn't do that. I know what black cops have to go through. I know what black CEOs have to go through. I can understand it and, and, and have an empathy for what a black general or a sergeant in the military has to go through. He has to both have to be able to uh, gravitate with not being too black in a, in a racist world and not being not black enough. You know what I mean? So I don't have that stress. I get to just be black all day long, no matter what. So I don't have the stress of, of having to be on both sides of the pentium. 
I could get up and say, hey, man, look, Mickey Wick, you and this is what this is and that. When you got other people who have to service the different communities that I don't have to. But I I, I, I know, I, I feel like, you know, Trump and, and, and Obama in concession have done so much for African-American men, game bangers alike, because for eight years, we were asleep. We thought we had overcome and we was on our way to overcome. Trump came in and, and let the world see. No, you ain't there. And you ain't going to be there for a long time. Because mm -hmm. Trump came in with a dose of American truth. White America is scared that they're going to lose their country and their white privilege in the next 50 years. And this is what we see with Trump. We see a fear that white America feels like they're going to lose their country. And Obama didn't really help us. Not much as I, I mean, it wasn't a lot he could have did with a Republican Senate anyway in a Republican House. It wasn't a lot he could have did, but he gave black men in our era a feeling of you can make it. And then Trump made us feel like you can be dumb and make it. You don't even gotta be smart to be president. You can be you can be the you can be the dumbest motherfucker in the school my language in the room. You just need to have a good team. You know what I mean? But I mean that's my dose on it. I mean I study <laughs> politics now more than I ever did in my life. I have more conversation. I swear to God and and, and this is why I want to say that under Donald Trump, I have had more political conversations with gangbangers, with, 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 with young black boys, 13, 12, 11, who are able to tell me what Trump says verbatim. These are guys who would have never knew nothing about politics prior to Donald Trump. So, Trump is having a Trump effect. I don't know if he realized he's having it, but he's having a Trump effect on the black men in our communities. I want you to but add let me, let me, let me just one, one second because it's really important because you, you know I've got a young mentee. Uh, I had a young mentee that uh, that was nine years old in the last part of the of uh, Obama's administration, and uh, the first thing he said to me when he walked up. He says, I said, what do you want to do? What do you want to be? So I want to be president. Now, up until Obama, what would somebody might have said? They, they, would, have said, they would have said, I want to be the first black president. Meaning they never really expected it until they got of some age. And when he said it to me, I pulled back because actually I... I I was a little stunned that that would be his response, but what it told me was Obama became an aspiration and an inspiration for an entire, because all he had ever known was a black president. That's just how it is. So, so, that, so that is one of the effects that he had. The second part is, the second part of, of him is this, and a friend of mine uh, said, one of the reasons why Obama was who he was and actually dreamed with some reality of it because his father was Kenyan. His father didn't have in him the ideas and the thoughts of American racism, and his mother had privilege. So that combination of two things was in him that most of us didn't contend with. And that's and, and you and your and your dad being of African descent from Africa, you know that that's like being in the HBC world. <laughs> okay. He understood that that's a big deal. And so that's what he, he kind of brought to the forefront. And that, that's also why <clears throat> when I went to the inaugurations, there was there was an element of pride. But at the same time, I'll be very fair with you. And Big Q, you hit on it. One is, is that I didn't want him to be a black president because if he was a if he was a black president, that's 13% of the United States. And oh, by the way, that's what those guys who wrote, you know, they, they imagined 
that he was going to bring not just the goodness of the culture, but all the things that they imagine and, and denigrate us for. I want him to be president. I really want him to do exactly what he did, but I really wanted some more, but he had the support. You hit the nail on the head. Local leadership, local folks caused that problem. And the not having a Senate and a Congress really impacted his ability to do an awful lot more. And this president has a mandate that he can execute and he has leadership, followership that one will break rules, that will break rules to do what he wants. That's different. That's very different. And that's what my fellow generals are talking about. One is a disrespect for the Constitution. I'm sorry, Nick, please. Man, you got beautiful weather out there, Big U. Man, it's good. I got thunder showers outside. Go ahead. Now, I, I, I want to uh, switch gears and also get your thoughts on this Juneteenth um, rally that Trump is going to do in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, and just, <laughs> I, it just seems like just when it can't get any worse, you know what I'm saying? And maybe Big U, that's what you was also you were you were speaking on. But you know that Trump is doing his rally June 19th in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which is the uh, site of one of the worst massacres of people of color in this country. Um, I don't know. I mean, which one, General Bray? You looking like you, you both are looking like you know you're shaking your head. Um, you know, I want to get your thoughts on that. You you can go first this time. I, I, I'll, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna back clean up on this one. You can miss. Okay, I, I'll go and do it. Here's the deal. One is is that I'm not sure who his handler was was thinking about this because it's it's a little bit of a slap in the face. It's, it's not a you know the military takes you to always say know yourself, know your threats, and um, I would have told him one you, you can have your conversation if you want to with America and you want to talk about racism, but don't go, but don't use the, the date of the, of the, of the last place where slaves were actually freed and don't use a location where there was the greatest atrocity, uh, one, one of the greatest single atrocities into the American, to the black American population to their understanding of wealth, economic freedom, and those who are trying to enjoy the potential of this nation. Don't don't use that date to make the statement. But because one, that means he doesn't recognize that he polarizes this nation. And he has a strong he has a strong following of people who not only are racist, but they are uh, they are actually anti, anti everything except white Anglo-Saxon American, and that is he he brings that out. And he, if, to 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 not understand that about yourself is either myopia or blatant arrogance. Mm. Mm. Big you, I gotta I gotta hear from you on it now. June nineteenth, Trump Trump Trump. I just say, uh, I say Trump is really out of touch. I mean, um, I just wonder who's really giving him, who really giving him his idea. Mm, we might have a bad connection. Yeah, he's, he's moving. Yeah, he's moving. Uh, but, but he but he hit on the same the same two points. Big U, if you can hear us, give us a thumbs up. I know you're moving. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah he, he, he's he's. Moving. I know this conversation is ongoing, General. This is a, this is this is. Did we we did we okay? There you go, Big U. Can you hear us, bro? You can you hear us. Big, you can you get? Can you hear us? Yeah, no, okay, maybe he'll he'll join us back, General Gray. But um, I think it's it's just it's just 
is the timeliness of everything that's happening. Obviously, we're going into an election year. We've had some significant trouble in the state of Georgia just from the polling uh, locations uh, uh, yesterday. So elect uh, the, the, the polls in Georgia were completely messed up, and it's a big conversation taking place here. So, I, you know, obviously I know it's politically motivated to do what he's doing on June 19th. I was hoping he doesn't pull Kanye up there or anything like that, but you never know. Oh, Big U, you heard me on that, didn't you? Yeah. I like Kanye. I'm, so, I'm sorry to say it. I was, I, I, I was hurt, though, when I seen some of the things that, you know, I was, I was hurt to see the blonde-haired Kanye with contact. And if I'm just being honest, you know what I'm saying, I just was like, damn, what's going on here? What, what are we really doing? And, 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 and it brings me to another question I got for you, but I want you to answer that, that question just about Juneteenth. If you can hear me, and I, I know you were going somewhere. Okay, I know you were going somewhere with it, so we definitely want to get your, your thoughts. No, I, I feel like Juneteenth, Juneteenth is a distraction. It's really a distraction with what's going on with George Floyd and the, and the, and the protests around the country. You know, one thing I tend to realize and I come to understand is these people do not do nothing on accident. He grabbed Juneteenth because he knew Juneteenth was going to be a, a, a catch sign to get everybody to listen and everybody to follow, to, to follow and pay attention to him. And it's working. You know what I mean? Because he chose that day. It's what Floyd used to do with boxing. Floyd would never fight a fight a, 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 a Hispanic or I mean a boxer unless it was Cinco de Mayo. Love him or like him, he's trying to get people in the audience to pay attention. That's all Trump trying to do. You see how much free politics he gonna get when I do music, right? And I do entertainment. When you promote the album or project. You just need to get the eyeballs. You need to get the eyeballs. You need to get the people to follow. You need to get people to pay attention. How else do you do that? You choose something that's going to spark the people. He's going to have more black people watching to see what he has to say because he's doing it on Juneteenth than he would normally have if he didn't. Think about it. So if I'm a promoter and I'm and I'm marketing an event, I just came up with the best idea, you know what I'm saying? The best marketing for it. You got to get the people in the room to hear what you got to say. And they're going to be there. <laughs> yes. On Juneteenth, he, 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 he shook the world up with that one. That was like, that came out of left field. Now, how it plays out, I, I, I tend to have a feeling that his uh his bedside manner and the words that he chooses he's not the best at actually communicating with us uh no matter what it is but i thought it was interesting and, and something else i wanted to ask both you and, and, and particularly you big you because i know you've got a great relationship with with jim brown who is somebody you know he's an icon uh he's a hall of famer but i kind of felt like a lot of a lot of us misunderstand things and i wanted to get your thoughts when jim brown went to meet with trump at Trump Towers, I believe he was with uh, Ray Lewis. And a lot of people get mad when we come take a seat at the table and hear what's going on. But I actually feel like Jim Brown can give us some real insight and perspective. He's sat with some of the worst uh, racists in this country. And he's been a part of some conversations. He's also been a part of, I think, some of the greatest unification when I saw his involvement with the LA gangs. And I know he's somebody that you've worked with. What do you think about that? And, you know, what do you feel about us sitting at the table with individuals like Trump? First of all, first of all, let me say that Jim, Jim is what Jim Brown is one of the one of the few men who put the brain, who put the mindset of Big U. So to do this work. So I, I love Jim. Secondly, let me say this. I don't know how you can negotiate without sitting down with your enemies. I don't know how you can come to an impasse or an understanding without first sitting down with somebody to figure out what it is that this problem this person has against you or what it is that you can offer this person to get to the next step or whatever what it be. I believe that you got to sit down with people. Can you hear me? 
Yeah, yeah, we are you. We are, you I, I was going to add to your comment because there's a there's a thing in the military we say if you if you're not if you're not at the table you're on the menu, and so <laughs> so you have to, you have to be able to talk to folks. The question is, you got to also know when you're being used. You got to be you got to have a voice because otherwise you're a photo op. And, right. and people can use a photo op to go ahead and manipulate you and your relationship. You know, if they want to just catch the handshake or the arm around your shoulder, you know, you got to be very careful. And, and, and again, so I was, uh, you, you know, and again, but this, you know, you 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 was on the one on this on this on this comment about picking and choosing. Remember, he's got this president has thirty six percent of the population. That will follow him through hell or high water. It won't matter. And he, when he said he could shoot somebody and walk away, basically, he wasn't lying. So everything he gets over and above that is gravy because they're going to come to, they're going to fight for him. And so to get people stirred up, to get that menstrual act that uh, you just pulled up. Is is important. He's 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 barnstorming. He's barnstorming, and we got to be very careful. Yeah, um, I definitely agree. So well, let me ask you this. I want to ask you, you, you did you this as well, but um, how do you see this whole coronavirus uh, situation, you know, Bray? And obviously, you know, uh, the protests and the response to what we're seeing has overwhelmed the whole coronavirus or COVID nineteen situation. Uh, it would it would seem like there's going to be a spike. I know that the black community is disproportionately affected by it, and it's it's really um, you know it's really attacking us. And I think the only people that can really save people of color are people of color. So uh, and and I say that from the standpoint of getting involved, getting the resources, uh, being involved, and in getting the messaging out there. But what is your what are your thoughts? Being in the military, seeing how the military is being used. I mean, obviously, if, if people are getting tear gas, General, you know, <laughs> they're going to be uh, 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 coughing and whatever else. I mean, 50,000 people in L.A., uh, you know, you go to city to city and you see large numbers of people that are out there. So we're talking about COVID-19 right now, Big U, its impact uh, on hip hop, uh, you know, banging. And I was asking General Bray his thoughts as well. But I like you guys. I heard, I heard, every, I heard everything you said. Cool. There, are two, there are two pandemics going on. The COVID-19 is a pandemic that's out there that, that one, and for me as a soldier, honestly, I, I always see it as an environment. Just like swamps, desert, heat, uh, biological NBC, it's an environment. Those that don't have to go in it shouldn't be in it. But, but, but the reality is there's a world that some of us have to be in and we gotta figure out how to, how to make that come to pass. There are some missteps in the first part. You know, one is you got to first of all isolate, and you got to know. We we didn't take the time to know. There's a there's a gentleman uh, named Keith Crawford who spent a lot of time trying to help know. There's a gentleman in your in your city, African American doctor, who has been saving lives at Grady Memorial, Dr. Ray Matthews. He absolutely can give help to the United States, but there are too many folks between him and the problem. But if they look at what he's done to save lives in Great Memorial, he can help, he can help you. So, so that's one pandemic. The other pandemic that's happened is that because of what has happened with, with George Floyd, he basically raised up the world's consciousness and has made them in many cases, look past the effects of the pandemic uh, and start to think about ways to try to fight this other, this other virus that's circulating in the world, which is an, an absence of understanding and respect and apathy for people of color. And until you know, and, and again, it goes this whole thing: if if one person is not free, nobody's free. And so people are starting to step across those lines. And the second part, I've said before, the world is browning. The world is browning, and so they know that their their son, their sister, their mother, their cousin, somebody is affected by this idea. And they know it's not going to stop there. So people, people are willing to take that risk. And they're trying to minimize it, but they're taking the risk to make sure their voices are heard. And so the question for us now is, 
So what? So what? What are you willing to What are you willing to do now besides besides just raise up besides show anger to really make the substantive changes to the young men and women and, and big you you show me a better you, you show me a whole lot of like I said from the beginning leadership that's untapped un and 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 evolved training street trained that could have been should have been refunneled. It had the right kinds of hands. And a lot of folks out there like that, that have been missed, that if we don't get them right, they're going to have their voices heard. And you got to figure out how to, how to do that uh, sooner rather than later. And hopefully you'll save me some time to talk about some of that. But go ahead, Big U. I mean, COVID, I, like I said, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a scientist. I can only go by trying to do as much research as I can on it. Um, I'm, a, I'm a history buff. I studied theology um, while I was gone. Uh, uh, so I've I, I seen and read about a lot of different plays that, that play different parts of, of uh, different parts of our existence. So I, I tend to look at it differently than other people's looking at it. And some people don't believe it's real, but I believe it's real because of the difference. Things that we have interjected in our body, we are putting the air, we are putting the water, we are putting. So how is it that we don't have? We haven't had nothing this big before, before now. But I say, I just say, and I try to tell people that no matter what it is, if it's real or not, they put something in the air that we need to be conscious of. You know what I mean? And it's, and, and why it's affecting black people. More in the United States of America because we are the less, we're the last on the total for it. We still just now, we only a couple of hundred years, we're a hundred years off of the slave plantation from eating pork and fat backs and all the stuff and thinking about ourselves the way we think about ourselves. So, yeah, we definitely, common logic would say that we would be more sick than anybody else because of the conditions. And the systemic racism that we have, that we that, that we are we are dealing with here in America. Has it impacted gang banging? In your opinion, uh, you? Huh? Has it impacted gang banging? Not in no way. I mean, it did because the streets was was, was shut down for a minute, yeah. so nobody was out. Um. Young people are going to be young people. Young people feel like they're invincible. You know, if you're under the age of 35, you feel like you're invincible. You don't understand your mortality or anybody else's mortality. Um, the general, uh, we had talked about earlier uh, about people when we were younger. And when you're young, you don't understand, you know, mortality. All you know is you're ready to face the world. You get up, you get dressed. You're going out. And the minute they start saying that it was old folks, the coronavirus was only affecting older people and killing older people, young people checked out at that point. They were basically checked out. <laughs> and I deal with young people. I deal with young people on a regular basis. So I am not a percent of people I deal with are all young. And they, their mentality is it's not going to affect us. I just can't go around my grandmother, who I love. So I, I'm going to make sure I cover up when I go around my grandmother. Or I'm going to cover up when I go to my auntie house. You know what I mean? So other than that. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. It's, it's, they, just, they just call it environment. They, they look at it like rain. Yeah. You know, I, I can get in and get out of it. And, and and folks and folks are doing that. I wanted there's there's a couple people who posted some questions, man, and I wanted to uh, uh, throw them out there to you both. Uh, Marlon Griffin says, "Thank you for your time today and for sharing your perspective and experiences." He says, "I'm tired of police that believe their job is to control and tame citizens like a zoo and a command and control style of dealing with, in particular, black men, women, and children." What are your thoughts on police? Uh, uh, beat cops not carrying firearms, thereby being forced to engage on an intellectual level first instead of going straight to the disrespectful treatment that leads to the aggression and tension between blacks and police. 
Mm. You said on police not carrying firearms? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what he said. Well, well, I think that if you take away the firearm, you take away a lot of the aggression. It's yeah. been done everywhere else in the world. You got a whole lot of police departments around the, around the world that don't that don't address their people with firearms. I believe if you if you start demobilizing, you'll demobilize the mentality also at the same time. Because I'm gonna say this, and I say this on every every show I do. Black men know you do not kill a cop. The last thing you do is you kill a cop. That's been enforced on us from the plantation. So black men don't go around shooting cops like white men do. So if you demobilize the police department this day, you won't have no lot of police getting shot by black men because they don't do it. I'm sorry. Look at the number. You don't got black men killing cops. You have more situation where the threatening situation of domestic violence and white men who kill cops. It's not going to come from the black community. I've got a cousin who's a policeman, and he said um, most policemen are actually even shot by their own pistol or some or one of the other teammates' pistols. I took my wife to, to, out to shoot, and uh, the first thing she said was, you know, I feel powerful. And that's what happens when you get a gun in your hand. Right. And so, and so, when you don't have that weapon in your hand, and and especially if you if you've never felt like you were, I don't want to say, you you were assertive in in who you are already, then that gun lets you step up to the plate. Uh, I'm sure you. I, I've been on too many playgrounds. I had a gun in my head a couple times on playgrounds. It was usually by somebody who was afraid of me. And so it was their way of stepping up to the plate to say, you know, we, we even now. This is the equalizer. Right. And so, so so again, but it goes back to I do I don't think you you take the weapons from the policeman. I think you I think you take the weapons from the policeman who confronts the problem. Because there are elements that can outgun a police a policeman. And so you gotta be very careful of that part too. But I think it has to be, no kidding, psychology and training that, that we really got to invest in. And I saw where someone was concerned and said their explanation of defunding the police is redistrib redistributing some of the funds that goes into the police forces. Well, I, I don't know what those numbers are. I don't know what it should look like or how many you should have, but I, I think the narrative of defunding sets a tone that says you want to go, but like my wife says, when she punches nine one one or Big U says, I want somebody to come there that's prepared to handle the situation as they understand it. But you want, but you don't want them to come in like the Wild West guns blazing, or to put fear in the people. I want them to dominate. I'll be fair. I want them to dominate the scenario. I want them to come in there where people know that I'm in charge. I'm in charge, but I'm in charge, and I understand human beings. You got to train that in, and that and, and that's not done when when your psychology isn't isn't right. So I, I I want to figure out what that right mix is. And by the way, they got to learn to respect not. And by the way, not be afraid going in, because nothing's worse than somebody scared with a daggum gun. That is bad juju. And and I you can chime in if you need to, but that's bad juju. Uh, and you got to watch out for that. Let me, oh. you know, let, let me say something to that, right? She asked about the black community. And I said, because, yeah, you can defund it with us because we don't kill cops. That's the reason why I say that. Now, if you're talking about the rest of these, these the rest of the world, these white cops, now you got two people who feel privileged. You got a white privileged guy who's a civilian who feels like, hey, I'm white. Take that mentality to the black neighborhood. He got a gun. You got a white cop who feels he's privileged. 
who feel he's the authoritarian here. He has a gun. Now you got two mugs who shouldn't have a gun who got a gun. Now let's go back to the black community. It just doesn't happen in the black community. Because that mentality has already been put in place. That they going to come down on you. That they going to come down on the neighborhood. It's going to be five million police officers whooping everybody but. It's a major difference. There is a difference. And I've seen it. I've been in a situation where I've seen white men talk to white cops. And it's totally different. The mentality is different coming from the white yeah. community. His mentality is, look, you work for me. I pay your taxes. And that is the mentality. But when you come in the black community, it could be 30 black guys. Only one black guy is going to say that. Out of 30. It's conditioning, though. Huh? It's conditioning, right? From the slave yeah. plantation you talked about, yeah. I, I agree. You. Yeah. You got it. That's a mindset. You know, I, I want to read you all both a, a tweet that um, Dr. King's uh, daughter, Bernice King, she sent out. And she said, don't act like everyone loved my father. He was assassinated. A 1967 poll reflected that he was one of the most hated men in America. Most hated. Many who quote him now and evoke him to deter justice today would likely hate and may already hate the authentic king. I thought that was very powerful coming from the city of Atlanta. And to understand, because a lot of times we get this one, this one uh, sided perspective, so to speak. And I don't think people understand that. I think even in that struggle that, you know, King's perspective was probably evolving and he was growing and changing as well every day because he was a young man. But I, I wanted to kind of get you all thought on this leadership and uh, where we are currently, present day, because even when you know when when you said the tanning of uh, of of the world or the tanning of America, you know General Bray, I think that's happening from within, and it's coming from the music, okay? Because hip hop, black culture runs the world. Black culture really runs. Black American culture runs the world, and I'm saying black America to be very specific. Because I think it's that experience overall that now, well, let me explain you. I'm going to tell you that hip hop is the language of the oppressed people anywhere you go. All right. Even the Taliban to Christian inspirational artists, they're all speaking. Well, say, and, and so they have a rep. Oh, go ahead. You, I don't want to hold you back. It used to be. No, no, it used to be until, until the powers that be changed the message. The message that's coming out right now out of hip hop is homosexuality, um, drug use, drug addiction, disrespect to everything. So this has changed in the last 10 to 15 years. It's not the same. You, you, you're coming in and out, man. You know, the, music, the music that used to influence the world is not that music. It, it, it's, it's R and B and dress, uh, and and I, I'm gonna go hit your point. I'm gonna amplify your point. I'm sitting here in Romania, and I go to this club, and this woman's singing, and she's uh, she's throwing down on uh, uh, Whitney on Whitney Houston, and I'm sitting there thinking, wow, she and she's on every bar, every bar. So she finishes singing. My friend yeah. and I, we try to speak to her. She doesn't speak, a, she doesn't speak a single uh, syllable of English. All she was doing was mimicking sounds, but it had reached her soul. And oh, by the way, you see the same thing in Korea, and you'll see the dress of the young men because it's our influence. I, I, I'm, 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 I don't know if they have necessarily pushed back on some of the other parts, but they're, but they're, the sex drugs piece pushes back hard against their culture and their older generation but we've reached a lot of a lot of the world with uh what is called stylish so so you spot on there both timing and and your point about influence in the world 
and you know it because you you've been on the on the continent and seen it happen. So, big you to your point, I wanted to just expand on it a little bit by saying that you know my family uh, coming from West Africa and seeing hip hop over there. Even I mean they're playing unedited versions of Tupac on the radio, and this is maybe when I was there in 07. Now, this whole recent year of return, I think it's very important that we speak on it too, General Bray, because I've always been of the mindset that when Africans and African Americans kind of connect and understand that we're really, uh, you know, we're really all the same and we're cousins, we're family, I think that we're going to be the ones to help improve a lot of things, not just for ourselves, but for the world. And I don't know if either one of you have ever been, you know, saying been home or been to Africa, um, just, just, you know, saying to really just connect and get back to it. But I feel like when I say black American culture, I've watched how hip hop has really changed the world. And I, I would agree that it, 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 it's morphed in a lot of ways in things that I may not agree with right now in 2020. But I think at its fundamental root, we're getting back to it because we have no choice. Because I also think that you had a lot of people who might have been millennials who at one time said, I don't see color. I don't, I don't, I don't recognize this. But now it's a different feeling. It's a different vibe. And I think that, you know, you couldn't have gotten people to, to, to demonstrate or protest 10 years ago the same way people are, are rallying together right now. And I feel like it's the culture overall. Now, you know, Dan, I, 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 I think that, you know, where Biggie was going, there are some things, things that have been bastardized within the culture. I don't think we control our image, but I also think as black men, we've never really been in charge of ourselves in media. So even when you have a lot of A and R's that aren't of color, they don't represent who we are. That's why the independent aspect of hip hop, I think, has really uh, allowed us to kind of have that balance because it was becoming very imbalanced. And I thought, you know, yeah, there there is uh, a lot of feminization of you know black males, and and that's what pushed in the sense of, hey, if that's who you are, I respect that. But you know, don't don't you don't have to disrespect me because I may not agree with that. That don't mean I hate you. That just means that this is my perspective. This is how I was raised. And it's, it's, it's okay. It is what it is. And I've learned even being here, coming from an African background where no, that wasn't readily accepted. You know what I mean? But in my own growth, hey, I'm okay with, you know, if that's who you are, cool. That's not who I am, but that doesn't mean that we got to hate each other. And I say that because being in America, there is no place uh, like America where you have these type of opportunities to do these things. There's a lot of work to be done in America, but I will say that, you know, we have an opportunity to help shape the narrative that the world is watching and that the world pulls from. Because at the same time, on the flip side, you have a lot of people, to your point, General Bray, when you mentioned being in Romania, you know, these people are listening to hip hop. They're listening to the word, to the N word, the nigga, and this. So they're repeating just what they hear because it's popular. It's just pop culture. You know what I'm saying? It may not necessarily have a racial uh, undertone for them because they're they're diving headfirst into our culture. And I feel felt like this is with Bill O'Reilly, where he was at when he was attacking hip hop in such a way. And I one time I had a conversation with Bill Cosby back then during that time because I felt like. They were using Bill Cosby, who he was, as America's dad. And at that time, it was convenient. But eventually, to your point earlier as well, uh, General Bray, you said, hey, if you ain't at the table, you're on the menu. I oftentimes say that about being the only black person or person of color in the room when you want to be the only one. You don't want to bring anybody else with you to the table so you can have a productive conversation. You want to be the only black person there because it makes you feel special. Nah, you are on the menu at that point. So I just feel like it's a real overall understanding. And, you know, just for me, I'm a product of hip hop. I was born and bred on that and raised on it. But I feel like there's a way that we have to look at it. And there's a lot that I feel like black America can do. And I feel like the world is watching this moment with George Floyd in a major way. You know what I mean? So what we do with and not only George Floyd, I mean, you have Breonna Taylor, you have Sandra Bland. Let's not even talk about, you know, the women that are now being handled in a fashion on camera that we've never seen is unprecedented. See what I'm saying? You know, you know, Breonna Taylor obviously was killed in Louisville. She was a first responder. She's an EMT. You know what I'm saying? Her boyfriend returns fire after being shot at in their home, but he's charged with attempted murder. 
And they let those charges stick for almost a week. I'm going to give you another term. Economics. Economics. Most of us still are treated based upon our far recognition signals. If you saw me in the street and you don't recognize me and you don't recognize me, people uh, will treat me a certain way. If you're Michael Jordan, you're not recognized as Michael Jordan or Michael Smith, you're treated a certain way because one, there's an expectation of who you are. But if they believe that you are somebody and you have economic means to be competitive, you get a different level of treatment. You know in the street where he's at, there's folks that they know he's you, he's you. If he's just another brother, he's treated differently. And so that still holds true. That still holds true in a lot of places on how on how a person is treated. The rest of the world at this point in time are watching us because we still, even some of the worst places in in this country, folks who are in the hood, you know, who are in the hood or or in urban areas, urban settings, they they still have a better footing than some folks in some parts of the world that are at average means and they're depicted a certain way. The Cosby views and other views put us into a view of a mainstream. So we get a chance to go and make the world look look a little different. Now I see you shaking his head because people were buying, some folks were buying into that as being real. You talk about the languages that you hear folks using, the, the, the N-word, of course, that used to automatically make me and others uh, react differently. But even now we still, even though it's out there, we know that some of us have said it's just part of the street. It's okay. And they accept it. I still can't get it in my diet. I don't use it, don't like it, uh, but, it but other folks have tried to normalize it. There's a lot of things that's going on right now that's, that's, that's cross-leveling. It, it, there are waves in the world that's going on. And people are trying to look at America to see where it goes to. And, and, and candidly, we can, in many ways, we're that because we have the most substantive populations in, uh, in, in the fight around the world. You talked about being a token or a wedge. That's what you really brought up. When I'm in the room, some folks are not going to like me because i got to speak. I know I have to speak. I know I have to say something. And, and, and by the way, not just to open my mouth. I have to make sure that my whole cloth is being represented. Because if you let me in the room, either A, it was a mistake on your part, because if you thought I'm going to be a token, I'm not. I can't be. Earlier you asked about being a black guy. I think Big U talked about it being a black guy at different places. I was once called by one of my superiors uh, or leaders, you're becoming a black guy. I said, sir, I'm, I am black and I am a general. And there are people who expect me to be able to make sure that the voices are coming to the table. So those of us who are fortunate enough to be at table have to make sure that nobody else states that that other folks don't end up on the menu as a result of the authorities and, and responsibility we've been given. Big U represents right now, he got 13 years having been on having having been incarcerated, still keeps uh, his pulse on the people and the young folks on the street. He has a responsibility. He knows it. He knows it. Some of the individual thoughts that he may have had about himself and and, and, and being a youth at one time, he knows he has to be bigger than that. That's why some of the points that he's having right now, he's trying to make sure that one, if I say something or you say something that, that he thinks is not reflective of the people that look up to him, he has to say something. Similarly, I have to say something. But, I, but at the same time, we have a responsibility to be authentic. You know, mm -hmm. And so we have to say, who we are all the time. That's that's the power of being a wedge and not being a token. Token is when you celebrate your arrival, your arrival. But we have to always make sure that there's somebody smarter, better than us behind us, that people know 
to expect him or her when she comes through the door. Absolutely. You go ahead, man, because you like you're going to go in some place. I see you getting a mask up, so do your thing. Yeah, no, um, I, 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 I heard some things. I wanted to say, you know what always bothers me? I'm, I'm gonna get off topic for a second. You know what always bothers me is when I hear people talk about how we are respected or America is respected, and America is such a great place. When you <clears throat> speak to somebody who who not really enjoying all the fruits of America, you know what I mean? And, and you're looking at it and you're saying, well, America is in, de in fact a great place because of all the free work that we got from other people. And the kids of those people is not enjoying America on a higher level. But you say we should be happy that we're not living on certain places of the planet Earth, that we're not going through water droughts and all this stuff. But I mean, if, 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 if I got to live in a nation where people like Trump got 4,000 houses and I'm struggling to maintain one, but my people, like the general, went to war for this country just like Drew Brees' fathers did to come back over here and get nothing. That's the reason why my uncle then was like, nobody ain't going to that no more because they ain't going to treat you no different. Because of their experiences. Now, if you go to the South, the way my mother and father and them used to live, when, when, when they met, my mother never let me wear a pair of khakis ever. She hated khakis. I never wore a pair of khakis ever, bro. Never put on a pair of khakis. Because she said they had to wear khakis to pick cotton. And my mother got out the South and the rest of them got out the South and started going to Chicago. From Chicago, they got to California. Because it was it was it was it was bad. And a lot of that has not changed. It may have changed for individuals, but it has not changed for us as a whole. And that's the problem. That's what we're looking at. We're looking at our conditions haven't changed for us as a people. If, if both Malcolm and Martin was living, they would still be fighting this fight. They just got good at masking it. And guess what? If nothing else has brought us nothing, we got the video camera. Now people got cell phones so they can see everything that's happening. This country has not changed. I was talking to somebody the other day that was telling me they wanted to make a donation to the NAACP. And they was asking me what did I think about it. And I told them from my perspective, I have never in my life seen help, got received any help or assistance from the NAACP. I don't even know what the purpose of the NAACP is. No, what's up? I'm going to do something that's, that's, that's kind of important uh, because you were in St. Louis, Big you, you were in St. Louis and you were in LA. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a 10 year old. Um, as a 10 year old, I, I, when, I, when I go to the bathroom, I used to look up and see white or colored. And not, I wouldn't even black, I told you, I wouldn't black the browns yet. I look up and see white or colored. And then I make a choice of which one to go to. I had to go back and I've been, I've been trying to go into my mind to try to figure out what was I thinking? How did I feel? So I'm saying this because as we are, and when you're still, you're still walking in crap, you're still walking in crap. And it feels like it. But if I look back at kind of where I was to where I got to, I, I would never have envisioned these opportunities. But people like Malcolm and Martin, you know, King was really killed not for black, not for racism. He was actually killed for the war on poverty because that was a strain 
of what we are about that affects an awful lot of our people that he was trying to change. The Opportunity Zones we talk about today, that was part of King's force enforcement into the housing and urban development because those Opportunity Zones were supposed to be do three things. Give a tax shelter to folks who had money, but reinvest in the people of that community to build something for that community that would employ people of that community. That's what he was really fighting for because he went to Chicago to learn some of that, to see it. Even drug his family into living in that so that he would understand, they would understand that part of the struggle. So two parts. One is, is that there's been change. It hasn't been as fast as we wanted to because it, it goes to two things. We've got to get our folks out to being in leadership positions so we can set the rules politically and the laws politically, that's to your point, you, at the local levels and get people who understand the impacts and hire the sheriffs, the people who will understand, respect, and develop the rules for the communities that they're in. So the change is happening, but it's, it is not happening with the expeditious, the speed that, that that should have happened because we haven't got the people in the laws and some of us, and this is why I get mad at Kaepernick, we don't vote. Man, we don't, you know, if you don't understand that you got to vote and, and by the way, take the platforms like like uh, like uh, uh, Jim Brown, when you got the chance and people are listening to you, when they're tuned in to you, make sure you talk. LeBron, Make sure you talk about those things because they don't have to talk. They don't have to talk. But when people are listening to you, make sure you use the platform. Be the wedge. Be the wedge. You say, you know, that's, that's, that's contradicting because, because we say LeBron, right? Yeah. Look what happened to Kaepernick. Kaepernick yeah, is LeBron. I, 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 I want him to speak. I want you and, to speak. Yeah. Yeah, but see, the thing is, there's always the fear that when you speak, you become Kaepernick. You yes, know what I mean? LeBron, LeBron can speak too loud. LeBron can speak too loud because the fear of becoming Kaepernick. If, look, when, but look, for LeBron really to speak and to really be, be, be saying something, he should have took a knee when the flag was played at, at, the, at the Cleveland Stadium. He should have took a knee. So what if he didn't feel that? Cap took a knee. Yeah, got it. Cap took a knee. And we but what if he didn't feel that? that point in this country because white people have to get it first. That's the point. We are such a small minority in this country. And what we are, what we we can talk for food. Hey, well, hey, Big U, Big this U, country U, has not right, recognized right, man. and they would. Oh, you can't use it. Yeah, you're not being heard. Okay, hold on, I gotta go through all this. Okay, good, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Sorry, mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. You, you still there? Well, anyhow, what I, I concur that that there are some things you want a person to do, but they got to feel it. I get, I, Go back. You back up. Go ahead. You're disappearing on us, man. We got, if you're just joining us, this is a Tech This Out uh, exclusive. So we have General Arnold uh, Gordon Bray, um, a decorated general in the U.S. Army, and we have uh, a decorated general from the streets in Big U. And uh, we having a real conversation is uh, two two worlds unite. And um, I think, you know, we're, we're getting some real, we're kind of peeling back some layers here, General, you know, and understanding some things. I, I like I like what you were saying. He was talking about what things that a person, but see, there's that's the part you got to be very careful. When I talk about authenticity, you know, authenticity. authenticity. A person has to has to say what's in their gut in the way that's out of their gut. So that is understood. And like I said, I, I, I can speak for, for myself. I can speak for folks that I know. I can speak for the conditions of the community 
that I understand or communities I understand. But I have to say it in a way that one, it, it's it's from my spirit, from my soul, as, as Ray Charles said, it's gotta be my soul music. It's gotta be my soul music. Big U has his, his way of saying it and, and he even has expectations of how he wants to have somebody presented. And while, and, and at the same time, you know, the Kaepernick's of the world, he expressed it in a way that one uh, calls some level of ostracization, but we gotta be also smarter. We also gotta be legitimate. At the time Kaepernick took his knee, he wasn't even starting anymore. Yeah. Okay, folks yeah. forgot that. He didn't do well, you know what I'm saying? Let me say this to you, General. That was my thought process on it. I don't think, I think there's a major difference between Kaepernick and LeBron because LeBron, in my opinion, has always in some way used his voice from Trayvon to, uh, you know, to the unarmed, to the, to the killing of uh, many unarmed black men, even when they wore those hoodies. I never felt LeBron, I never felt fear in, his, in, in him, his, his, his willingness to risk it all. Now, I can't say that. Michael Jordan, as much as I respect him, I never felt like Michael Jordan from a social justice perspective, really, that was not his positioning while he played. I felt like for LeBron, he was. I feel like for Kaepernick, no, he wasn't. And maybe he had an awakening whenever he had that awakening in terms of a shift in his spirit. I respect Colin Kaepernick. I respect him landing on the line. I do think that it, it was a precedent that was a, a new precedent that we were really evaluating when we looked at him wanting to come back to a league when typically when you are gone and you get a settlement and we don't talk about that enough. Now I respect Cap, but I knew that he took the settlement and I was like, well, if it is that I would have, I would have preferred ideally. And I don't know the ins and outs of his circumstances. I respect Colin Kaepernick and what he did, but I would have thought maybe he could have just simply um, said, okay, cool. I'm not going to go back to lead. I'm going to do my work with Nike. And I'm gonna do this social act, this social justice work, much in the way that I felt like Muhammad Ali did. Okay, because I felt like Muhammad Ali was willing to walk away from everything in the name of what it was until they got it right. Now, again, that's not a knock on Colin Kaepernick because Muhammad Ali, those are some real shoes to fill, and I feel like by any man, you know what I'm saying. However, I understand and I felt the same way that you did, uh, General, about how I thought it might have been handled or could have been handled um, a bit differently, you know? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, and, and again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm definitely not going to try to, you know, I've, I've never been a quarterback of an NFL team. Uh, I, I, so, so, so he knows all those things. But like I said, the key thing is, is for me was he, at the time, if he was feeling those things when he was a starter, when he had just left the Super Bowl, when he and and he was legitimately the star of that team, those feelings didn't come out. In fact, in the, in fact, in the spring before the start of that of that year, he in fact spoke against uh, the 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 uh, against uh, Hillary Clinton. He spoke against her, and and some people forgot that piece because in the fall he does the knee thing, and of course he lets a person like. Uh, our current president used that as a divisive piece to go forward. It, it it was, but but again, let's not get away from that because that would add to what we're talking about. Because what he did do was this: he brought an awareness similar to the to, to the to, to the George Floyd scenario. Right now, George Floyd, his death, his death has done more for the world than his time as a bouncer his time in Minneapolis just existing because people now realize all the other people, the, the Rodney Kings, even the MLK's deaths didn't make every part of the world rebel. The world, the world is rebelling right now. Absolutely. The whole world. Is not, we're not talking Detroit, New York, Chicago, LA, Atlanta. We're talking about London. We're talking about Australia, Melbourne. We're talking about Korea. We yeah, we're all over because everybody realized that there's an injustice being uh, uh, that's being applied and because oh by the way, they realized that it could be their cousin, brother, sister, mother for whatever reason that's being affected and that's a big deal. 
And, and I don't know how much time we have left, but before we do, I, I really want to make sure that people understand. Sure. We've tossed around a lot of different discussions. But the real change that's going to that's going to come to any of our communities has got to involve what I call the four pillars and and, and is being echoed by HUD, uh, uh, the housing and development. But we've got to really start looking at the physical and mental well-being of our communities, wherever they are. We got to start looking at the character leader development that those that that we have, and folks like you and I. I mean, the Panhellenic, we've got to be in those places en masse, and we've got to work together. We've got to make sure that when we talk about education and help to change it, transform it, make sure that we do an education from a science, technology, engineering, math, and arts for the innovation piece on our kids in a way that they learn how to think, not just toy tinker with biology and, and science, but how you think to take something to go from one place to another. And then the last part that has substantive legs that we're gonna need. We've gotta start looking at financial literacy of our kids and wealth development. Cause right now wealth development, and this is where man is right in our face. We gotta start thinking about longer than tomorrow, longer than next week and longer than next paycheck. So we've gotta start doing that. And there are organizations out there trying to do it. And we can talk about more later on, but I want to make sure that pillar, those pillars, were part of our discussions for real change. Well, I, I, I certainly agree with you, General Bray. I want to say thank you. I, I think we're going to have to have a part two to this conversation um, because I think there's a lot of things for us to kind of, you know, peel back and just uh, continue talking about. And I think that we're going to see even more uh, developments as it relates to this George Floyd case, Breonna Taylor. Um, and just the countless other cases that Ahmaud Arbery, um, you know, just so many things that are going on. I, and, and I don't think that, um, I, you know, I'll say this as we wrap, you know, I, I don't think it's a coincidence either that any of this is all happening right now where everyone can see. I think that we were, you know, in 2019, we were looking at the year of return in terms of uh, uh, many, you know, uh, African-Americans uh, coming back to Africa uh, after what is, you know, transpired. And I think that there's a passage even in Genesis. I'm not a Bible thumper, uh, General Bray, or anybody that, you know, I'm not going, I'm not going to pretend to do that, but I, I do know that there's a strong passage that talks about being in a foreign land and, you know, some, some just powerful scripture. And I think that now that we're seeing all of this, this, this huge uprising around the world, and you are a military man, so I certainly, respect you know your background your experiences and i know that they all play a part in your leadership you know saying today so i feel like you know we really were able to discuss some things and i appreciate you being so candid and real and honest and unwavering and just speaking the truth and i respect that and i think that you know there's a lot more conversation that we all need to continue to have and like you said about the pan-hellenic council um you know since you're an alpha and i'm an omega We'll just leave it at that um, and say that, you know, when it comes to the beginning and the end, we'll have some dialogue that really helps to bring things together and fills in things. So uh, thank you, General Bray. I know we, we lost Big U. We appreciate, you know, his participation. You know, I know there's a lot going on and he's in, uh, he's in L.A. and he was, he was moving and, and our, our signal was a little uh, complex, but I'm looking forward to our next uh, discussion. Indeed. Well, you know, I, I am too, and I appreciate it. And really and truly, I, uh, I, uh, I think, I think the world of uh, of you in trying to give back, reach back, uh, and and I know that uh, his connections keep him connected in a different way in some cases. Um, but I, I know, I know that uh, he speaks for a lot of other folks that we need to get earlier, so that one, we, we don't want to create big use in the version that he has, the pathway he did, but we wanted to create the, those the minds and leadership. And you heard an incredible amount of common sense and complex thought that he exposed. And there's a whole bunch of folks out there that have that. And that's what we gotta do because that's the world we really have to unite and move forward in this country. And again, for that flag that I still respect. Absolutely. General Bray, man, you're a great man. What'd you say, sir? I said, really, the Constitution for which it stands. The Constitution Absolutely. for which it stands. Absolutely. Absolutely. I get it. The spirit of it all. So, 
So thank you, General Gray. I appreciate you so much, man. And uh, I, I thank you too for your service and, and everything you've done in representing us the way that you have, man. I, I, I feel very confident knowing that when you go into the room, you speak well on behalf of all of us. You know what I mean? So continue to do that. And, uh, uh, and uh, again, if we can do anything here for you. Two Worlds United, uh, General Arnold Gordon Bray, Big U, um, and myself, Osei Kwaku, here on Tech This Out. We'll uh, see you again very soon and next time.